of a city called glory so bright and so fair when I entered the gates I cried holy the angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion. And oh, the sights I saw. But I said, I want to see Jesus. He's the one who died for all. I bowed on my knees and cried, I cried holy, I cried holy, I clapped my hands and sang glory, I sang glory to the sun of God. As I enter the gates of that city, all oh, my loved ones all knew me well. They took me down the street. Such scenes too many to tell. I saw Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. I talked with Mark and sat down with. Timothy, but I said, Timothy, I want to see Jesus, for he's the one who died for saying glory glory I bowed on my knees and cried holy I clapped my hands and sang glory I clapped Oh! 
I sang glory to the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Glory. Glory and honor and praise. He is ever worthy. He is ever worthy. If you've been following along the last few weeks, we've been working our way through the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be in the second chapter of Nehemiah. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 20. This past week, uh, completely unrelated to this study, uh, I was looking through some pages and papers, and I ran across a little posty note. Can y'all believe there, there, if you've been in my office, some of you see posty notes everywhere sometimes. But I put them in books and I put them in different places. And I ran across this note, this quote I had written from one of the times when I heard Don Moore come and speak. And I don't know if it was at our church or whether it was at a state convention meeting. But uh, many of you are familiar with Brother Don. He leads the senior adult prayer ministry in our state and, uh, and just... It's amazing. He's in his 80s, and he says when he preaches, he just preaches as strong as he ever did and, uh, or ever has. And, and God is continuing to use Brother Don. I was blessed uh, at this, uh, this past month to be able to join him and others to, uh, to be a part of the minister's prayer gathering. And he and I walked in about the same time, and he said, Mike, won't you come sit with me? And I said, okay, I can do that. But uh, it's always a blessing when I'm around, Brother Don. But I ran across this quote that I wasn't even looking for, but here's what it said. He said, I am here to make a difference. The greatest tragedy of my life would be to die and not make a difference in my world. You know what? As we're continuing our study through Nehemiah, I want you to see some things about Nehemiah in this chapter that demonstrate why he was someone who made a real difference in his world. And I, I want to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word, Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning uh, in verse 9. This is what we read. Then I came to the governors of the providence beyond the river, and it gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased him greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. And I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring to the dung gate, and I expect, inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down. It's gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate, to the king's pool. But there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went in the night by the valley and inspected the wall. And I returned back to the inner by the valley gate. So I returned and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, the rest of all who were due to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer derision. I told them that the hand of my God had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. 
And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Then Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, the Ammonite servant, and Geshem, the Arab, heard it. And they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you were doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will rise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, we thank you that at just such a time in the history of your people in Israel, you raised up a Nehemiah. And God, you used him to make a difference in his world. God, we come before you tonight, and that's what we desire. God, we want to be men and women. We want to be people that you use to make a difference in the world where you've placed us even today. We pray that you would take Nehemiah's example. You would take the words that we've just read and speak it to our heart and our life in a fresh way. And Lord, we ask that and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When it comes to making a difference in the world, and, and as I studied back through this, in the light of what that quote had said, there were several things that I believe were true in his life that, that need to be true in our life if we're truly saying, I want to be someone who makes a difference in our world. And here's the first thing. What was the very first thing that Nehemiah did when he got from Babylon all the way to Jerusalem? The very first thing he did, it seems to say that he didn't do anything. It seems to say that he got there and he was there for three days. And he hadn't told anybody what he was up to. Now, do you know what I believe he was doing? It's what you and I need to do if we want God to use us to make a difference in the world in which he's placed us. He was waiting on God. If you remember back when we were looking at the very start of Nehemiah and his brother had come from Jerusalem, and he asked about the welfare of the people in the city. And his brother told him, and it says that he sat down and he wept for many days and prayed and fasted. He took time at the front end of this chapter just to be still before the Lord. Just to listen and say, God, what are you wanting to do? And then when he had his opportunity to share with the king... You know what? He had thought it through, what he would need to do, and, and he sought God's leadership in it. But one of the things that stands out that he did, even at the very start of this passage, it just says he was there for three days. But I believe he was doing what you and I need to do if we want to see God use us in a significant way. He hadn't done anything because God hadn't told him just what to do as yet. I want you to know, sometimes we associate activity with spirituality. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you and I can do is just be still. Do you remember what it says in Scripture? Be still and what? Know that I am God. Sometimes we get in such a hurry to get things done our way that we never stop to say, God, what is it that you want to do? God, is it what are you up to? This morning in my daily devotion, I've been reading through the Bible and, and this morning the very chapter that I was on to read was Isaiah chapter 40. And you remember what it says in Isaiah chapter 41? 40 verse 31, 
Those that do what? They wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. I've shared with you a message I've preached before about waiting on the Lord. And when you and I wait on the Lord, he knows how to, to get us up, get us going, and keep us going. But far too many times, I think we get ahead of the Lord. We don't really wait on him for his leadership and what he wants to do in our life. He didn't know just what God was up to or how God wanted him to come in when he got there. God did not give him a complete blueprint that says, okay, here's what you're going to do when you get there. I've shared with you before. When it comes to knowing God's will in your life and my life, the place to start is in doing what we know to be God's will. And it's amazing when we get busy about doing what we know to be God's will that he'll give guidance and direction in our life. He was at one of those places. He wasn't sure what the next step was going to be. God had been working. God had brought him there. But for three days, it seemed like he didn't do anything. You could say, well, he was resting and he was recovering. And that's certainly true. But I think what he was doing was what you and I sometimes need to do. If we want God to use us, if we want to be used to make a difference in our world, we need to learn to wait on the Lord. And then the second thing he does is he begins to face the facts. He begins to assess the situation. It talks about, so I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. And it says, then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put in my heart to do. When had God put in his heart what he needed to do? When he was waiting. When he was being still and seeking the Lord. But as he starts out, he goes out with just a few men. And it says there in those following verses that he went out to inspect the walls to assess the condition, realize that the walls around Jerusalem had been torn down for almost 150 years since Babylon had come in and taken possession and started deporting people. They had lived in this kind of circumstance for an extended time. And it says he went out to inspect. And it's interesting, that word inspect is the same word that's used in some translations to probe the wall. And it's a word that would be a medical term that would be used of a doctor who would be probing and investigating a wound to see what was going on. What he was doing was taking a realistic look at the situation. If we ever expect to see things happen in our lives, in our homes, in our church, we need to sometimes step back and realistically accept, assess the situation, the difficulty. There is no profit in sticking your head in the proverbial sand and just pretending it's going to go away. Neither is there benefit in sticking your head in the clouds and just assuming everything is going to be great. You know what? I think he was taking an honest assessment and a realistic look at what was going on. But I want you to know, being realistic about the situation does not mean be pessimistic. Because you and I know with God what? All things are possible I mean when he went out and looked at everything it was as bad as it could possibly be and yet 
It wasn't anything that God couldn't handle in his way and in his time. He was honest about the situation and circumstance. You know, I, I can just share with you that one of the things that I thought about is this morning I was talking about how we need to share the gospel with children and we had uh, a young man come forward this morning and we, we talked about how we needed to come to Christ. The very first step in someone coming to Christ many times is just being honest about their situation. Being honest about the fact that all of us are sinners by nature and by choice. All of us are in need of salvation. We have to be honest about the need in our life if we want to experience God's grace in our life. And then in verse 17, he, he exhorts them, okay, it's time for us to begin to rebuild the walls. Now realize they have been living in this rubble for over a hundred years. They had grown comfortable with how things were. Have any of you ever been in a house that had a broken window? And at first you think, we need to fix that. If you let it go long enough, what happens? You just go, grow accustomed to it being broken. That's what the, they had just gotten comfortable with their situation. Let me tell you. When Nehemiah came in, he said, folks, it's time for us to do something about this. It's time for us to get busy in doing what we can to remedy this situation. When it comes to experiencing the Lord working in miraculous ways, do y'all remember the miracle where the very first miracle Jesus performed, what was that first miracle? Do y'all remember? Turn the water into wine. He was at a wedding and they ran out of wine. And do you remember his, his, his mother who must have been in charge of the wedding and, and, and maybe she was the, the wedding director. We don't know all those kind of things and what they did back then. But she comes to Jesus and said, they're out of wine. And Jesus says, woman, my time has not yet come. And you know what? Being a mother, many of y'all know what that's like. I don't. She just turns to the servants. And here's what she said to them. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. She didn't try to talk him into it. She didn't try to debate it. She just turned from him to the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Many times the key to seeing God work and move is just you and I being willing to do what Jesus tells you to do. Nehemiah says, okay, it's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to build. And then he doesn't just tell them that we need to build. He challenged them to believe in God with him. Notice, notice what else it does. What else he does. He says in verse 18, And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And it says, And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Realize that when he first came in, he didn't call a meeting and say, Okay, I'm here from the king, and here's what we're going to do. Like I said, he spent time waiting on the Lord. He inspected and assessed the situation. And I believe God led him to say, Nehemiah, it's time for you to tell these people how I've been working in your life to bring you to this place and to this time. 
You see, everything that Nehemiah did was in response to what God was leading him to do, and it was definitely a step of faith. He went from being a cupbearer to the king to the governor of Jerusalem. That's a pretty radical change. And he said, how did I come to be here? Because the hand of God was on my life. And I can imagine him rehearsing the story of how when he had heard, he'd wept, he'd prayed and fasted for days. And he says, one day I was before the king and he had never said anything like this to me before. But that particular day, there must have been something about my de demeanor that caught his attention. And he says, why are you sad in my presence? And, and I just want you to know, at first I was nervous. Because you're not ever supposed to be sad in the presence of the greatest king of all the land. I was serving him and, and he took notice of me. He had learned to trust me as a confidant. I was there when things happened. And he said, why are you sad? And when I told him, you'll never guess what he said. He said, so Nehemiah, what do you want me to do about it? And if you remember, it's one of those passages where it says, and I prayed and I said, <laughs> that was last time. You know, there are times when you don't have a whole lot of time to pray. And it was one of those times he's going, okay, God, what do I say? And he began to tell him, how can I not be sad when the, 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 the walls are torn down, the gates are destroyed, my people are living in poverty? How can I not be sad? What do you want me to do? Well, King, why don't you send me to go rebuild the walls? And, and King, I need you to give me letters to those who are in charge of the timber and those who are in charge of the resources to help provide the materials for the rebuilding of the wall. And then you remember we talked about he didn't even ask for a military escort but the king not only sent him letters and sent him to say, go and do this task, <laughs> he sent the army with him. And so when he came into Jerusalem, you can imagine he got everybody's attention. And everybody was wondering, okay, what have we done? Why is this man here? And he said, the reason I'm here is because God brought me here. Because God has given me a mission and God has shown me favor and he wants me to help you and lead you in rebuilding the walls and restoring the gates. And as he shared his testimony of God's work in and through his life, guess what? They said, we want to be a part of that. We see God's hand at work in your life. We see that God does remember us. God hasn't forgotten us as we had begun to think. God has just forgotten all about us. God has sent you. And we're willing to join with you in this work. When he said arise and build, they got on board. They believe God with him. And then there's one more thing that he does that you and I need to be willing to do if we're going to be someone who makes a difference in our world today. He has to deal with critics. Did you know any time that you try to serve the Lord, any time you get serious, about trying to make a difference in the world, there are going to be those about you who are standing back ready to criticize you. Now just know this, nobody ever builds a statue to a critic. But almost every statue you see, that person had to deal with some criticism and critics. 
to make a difference in their world. And, and that's what it says. Let me just point this out to you. It says, so they strengthen their hand to the good work, but, oh, that's a big but in verse 19. But when Sanballat, Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, the servant of Geshem, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us. They despised us. What is this thing that you were doing? You are rebelling against the king. And in fact, we're going to see in later verses how they actually tried to stir up some issues and some conflict between him and the king. But I like how he responded. He says, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we, his servants, will arise and build. And then he says, but you have no portion in Jerusalem. I want you to know he declared his complete dependence upon God. If you and I want to be someone who makes a difference in our world today, like Nehemiah, our dependence needs to be not on who we are, what we are, what we can do. It needs to be on the Lord. And then he expressed to them his determination. Arise, we are going to rebuild the walls. And as we're going to see going through the book of Nehemiah in coming days, God blessed them and they did it in record fashion because the hand of God was upon them. When it came to his critics, he denounced them. He said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to the Lord and what he wants to do in my life. What he wants to do in this situation, in this circumstance. Nehemiah was a man who was used of God to make a difference in his world. And I want you to know, God wants you and I to be different makers difference makers in our world today it may be in our home it may be in our neighborhood it may be in our community it may be within our church the question is are you going to be someone who's willing to wait on the Lord and allow him to lead you and use you to his glory. Because at the end of the day, in Nehemiah's life, he was just pointing people to God. The hand of God. You want to know the secret to me making a difference? I was in a place where the hand of God was on my life. I've shared with you before what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. Even today, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout all the world to show himself strong through those whose hearts are completely his. May that be true of you and I today. Would you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, I come and I thank you for your word and how we're challenged by Nehemiah's story and how he was used in such a significant way by you to make a difference in his world. God, we live in a world that is so messed up, that's so broken. God, we come from homes and families and situations that, Lord, there are a lot of times we just don't know what to do. Even as you strengthened Nehemiah, even as you gave him guidance, even as you showed him favor, God, we pray we would be men and women, we would be a church 
that you can show your favor not just on us, but through us, that other people can see and recognize it's not us, it's you. God, help us to be willing to be used to make that difference in our world as a result of our commitment, our relationship, and our obedience to you. And Lord, we pray and we ask that again in Jesus' name.